Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of the Leaders in Value Chain podcast. I am your host, Radu Palamariu, and with a super exciting guest, we have joining, I think, I haven't checked, but I think all the way from Hawaii, Guy Kawasaki, <laughs> who is the, you'll tell me if it's true or not in a moment. So Guy Kawasaki, he needs no further introduction, but just for those of you who just in the odd chance don't know all of the things he's done, here's a, a snippet. I'll start with a short bio. He's the chief evangelist of Canva. I think it's a tool that many, many of us use dear to my heart for sure and our marketing team, they love it. He's also the creator of Guy Kawasaki's Remarkable People podcast, an executive fellow of the Haas School of Business for the University of California, adjunct professor at the University of New South Wales. He was chief evangelist at, at Apple as well. He is a trustee of the Wikimedia Foundation, has written many cool books and the latest one, which is Think Remarkable. We will be talking at length about it today. So Guy, pleasure to have you. Thanks for joining. Oh, it's my pleasure. What what better way to spend an afternoon? I'm in California, by the way. There you go. I, but you were born in Hawaii, so they, I mean, I I was you know, born I, in Hawaii. I, yes. I, just <laughs> just a position in my in my mind. Now I I took time and I I read your long bio on the website. So you have a long <laughs> bio on your website, and I don't know if you if you wrote it. I believe you did. It was one of my favorite bios to read and i i just want to spend if you're okay just want to spend some snippets i won't read all of it but there's some snippets that really cracked me up guy so okay. i just have to share it with, with the whole audience i did right? write it by the way i was i was sure you did yeah so you know you you share a little bit of where you started the school and so on and then you say <laughs> then you say that you attended stanford yeah in 1976 with a major in psychology which Guy says was the easiest major he could have found at the time. <laughs> then after Stanford, you attended the law school, yeah, because his parents wanted him to be a doctor, lawyer, or dentist. However, he only lasted one week because he couldn't deal with the law school teachers telling him that he was crap and they were going to remake him. So lovely mantra. I, I stand by that as well, Guy. Don't listen to people <laughs> that tell you you're crap. <laughs> then it gets even better. So Guy enters the MBA program at U UCLA, likes the curriculum better. He, he works for a fine jewelry manufacturer. So for everybody listening to this, I think this is quite cool. Yeah. So he uh, Guy came from jewelry, yeah? Nova Stylings. His first real job, counting diamonds. So not a bad, not a bad job at all. And then you say that you learned how to sell. So we'll, we'll go into that because it's also one of the chapters in the book, right? Then you say that you went in to work for an educational company and you were, and they wanted you to move to Atlanta. Here's another piece that I absolutely love. You <laughs> said, I don't think so. It was your reaction because he, you couldn't live in a city where people call sushi bait. And I stand by that as well, guy. You should not do that. If you don't appreciate sushi, screw them. <laughs> so <it's, laughs> um, and I'll read just one more. Uh, luckily, his Stanford roommate, Mike Boych, got Guy a job at Apple, so one could make the case that Guy owes Mike everything. When Guy saw what a Macintosh could do, the clouds parted and the angels started singing. For four years, Guy evangelized Macintosh to developers, and he also met his wife at Apple during this time frame. Apple was very good to Guy, so this was in the 1980s. So I'll stop there, but I absolutely love these pieces. There's quite a few more. So for those of you <laughs> watching this, read the long bio of Guy on his website because it's just wonderful. Okay, I I read I I wrote that bio and it <laughs> took me a while. So and and you know what, yeah. a lot of places where I speak, they copy that bio and they and they read that bio to introduce me to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's brilliant. I mean, it's just simply uh, uh, it's, nothing like having to dig yourself out of a hole before you speak. <laughs> <laughs> but but and, and I'll I'll start here because it's something that um, so what we deal with in general at Elkut Global a lot of corporate environments we 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 do executive search we do headhunting for top level positions and I am a little bit frustrated. I'll owe that and I'll start there with the. I'm not your fun. psychiatrist. No, no, no. no. We, I actually studied psychology myself as well, right? Also because it was easy. So we, we, we you know, we, <laughs> we align on that. But I think there's a lack of fun, guy. 
I, I think it's a very serious, tends to be, I don't want to overgeneralize, but it tends to be a fairly serious environment in most companies. And I'd love just to start there on what do you think the purpose of fun and just having a fun environment, does that help leadership? Does that help companies? Does it make it cooler to work or not? I, mean, I cannot build a case where purposely making your company not a fun place and a place people don't like to be is productive. I mean, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what? What, what kind of reverse law? I, I, maybe that's true of the Republican Party in the United States. <laughs> but other than that, I mean, it should be fun to go to work. And, you know, people, I think I learned from Steve Jobs that people want to believe in what they do. And I listen, I think that fun, which is kind of the flip side of a sense of humor, I think that a sense of humor, that is the ability to make people laugh and the ability to know when something is funny is a sign of intelligence. And so when you meet people who cannot crack a joke and they cannot take a joke and they cannot laugh at a joke, I think you're probably dealing with stupid people, <laughs> quite <laughs> frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Or insecure. So stupidity is one. I think insecurity, and you talk also about embrace vulnerability, right, in, in the book. I think it, it probably is insecurity in my mind, and I'd love your thoughts, right? Because I come across sometimes, you know, it's a CEO or a board member. If they are overly serious, I'm like, what's your problem? You know, I mean, like, yeah, what, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I would say that the person who is insecure and cannot take a joke, cannot make a joke, they probably are insecure and they're probably stupid. I mean, so that's a deadly combination. You know, if you're stupid, but secure, okay. And if you're secure, but you're, you know, you're not, but you're smart, that's okay. Or, well, I guess a secure, stupid person isn't, no, that's not a you, good you combination. Have a <laughs> for, you have a few running for president guy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, um, yeah, I'm yeah. telling you, I'd, I'd rather have an old president than a crooked one, but that, <laughs> I digress. Yeah. Fair, fair enough. Then I, I know in, in, and I want to bring to, you know, bring the topic to think remarkable. And I've, you know, I've gone through a little bit. The, I haven't yet fully read the book. I'm, I've, I've ordered it. I saw the summary of the book. I listened to some of the interviews that you've already given on the book. And of course, the book is at the back of, you know, you've, you've done a an, an remarkable job of having some amazing people on your podcast, yeah, on the Remarkable People podcast. In the book, you talk about don't follow your passion. Yes. Um, and I want you to, to share some anecdotes about that because we have, you know, a lot of people listening to this, a lot of young people listening to this. It tends to be more, you know, more evangelized when you're young than when you're older, yeah. perhaps, but I okay. think, tell us a little bit. So it's not that I don't want you to follow your passions. I don't want you to set such a high bar for what you follow, having to be your passion, because it sets a bar that's artificially high and is probably going to lead to frustration. It, it's as if that you know, people are expected to, quote, find their passion, and it's an instantaneous fall in love. I mean, to use a dating analogy, it would be like saying to somebody, you're 20 years old. You haven't found the, the man or the woman that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. What's wrong with you? You know, you need to get out there and find your passion. You need to find your woman. You find your man. And I'm telling you, when you're young, you should do a lot of sampling, which is I don't, I don't know. That word might not fit too well with dating, but it's sampling. That's what you're doing. And so I, I think the same thing is true. So rather than trying to find your quote passion where you passionately fall in love and, you know, that's the rest of your life. I think you should have an open growth mindset. And when things come across your radar that interests you, I want you to have an open mind and pursue your interests. And it could be writing, speaking, videography. It could be art. It could be surfing. It could be, you know, it could be accounting for all I know. But it, when something interests you, pursue that. And over the course of a lifetime with a lot of sampling of a lot of interests, 
may you discover three or four passions. But don't don't set yourself up by failure by saying, oh, I'm going to find my passion. It's going to be the one true love of my life and it's going to be instant and I'm going to instantly be good at it because it ain't going to happen that way. And I, I want to double click a little bit and bring it to you because you're you seem you definitely not seem you for sure are a man of many passions and you know you've gone from <laughs> jewelry to technology to selling computers to building software to well you know, da, 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 you da, know da. now you're also we we didn't mention but you're also an evangelist well, for the, Mercedes, the... so you probably like cars as well or you must because okay <laughs> well there's two factors to that one is that I truly do believe in the growth mindset. So when I encounter something that I find interesting, I dive in. So I took up ice hockey at the age of 44. I took up surfing at the age of 60. And let's just say that that's not typical age for people to take up sports like 44, like hockey and surfing. So that's one thing, you know, why I, I appear to have so many different interests. The other thing is that, frankly, I'm old. I'm 69 years old, so I've had a lot of time to do sampling. If I were 29 and I had already tried all these things, you might say, yeah, guy, I mean, you really are, you really are a, a remarkable sampler. But I've just had a long time to sample things. Now, if you're young, if you're 20 some, you know, or 18 or something, and you're listening to this, so your lifespan is probably going to be 90 years, right? So you have another 60, 70 years to try shit. So you ought to like try as much as you can because you got a long life. You know, you, you don't need to like get into a rut or a box soon. Mm. Now, you know, my, myself, I didn't know it at that time. I super resonate with what you just said. So I, I was a generation Y, you were fairly typical. I think I had five, six jobs in five years at some point. Eventually I settled to exec search about 10, 15 years ago. But I can't, I can't imagine that it was easy it, for me. Okay, maybe the, the times has changed and I was very lucky. But in your day and age, yeah, when, you know, this was quite a few years back, I, I don't think it was very typical that for a person to do so many things, even if you're now downplaying it a little bit. You've tried quite a few things early on. How, how was it? And I, I would want to potentially put this context of, I think there's this big social construct that we society puts on us of what you should do, how you should be, how you should live. How was it for you and what helped you break free? Because I'm sure you had some limiting beliefs uh, at that time. You know, I think it's your life. You should live it the way you like. And that often includes defying your parents. Uh, and I, ca I cannot tell you that I had an overall like life plan to, you know, go from jewelry to computers, to software, to internet, to podcasting and writing and speaking. Things just appeared to me and they interested me and I did them. I mean, it was, it's that simple. I, I do not and did not have a life plan. And, you know, God bless you if you can execute on a life plan. I think you're going to have a very boring life. But I, I, I think that, you know, a lot of what determines success is that you're in the right place at the right time. And you are willing to grow and you are willing to take a risk. The, the concept of you graduate from college and then you, you go to work for a Fortune 500 company for the next 25 years and you retire, that's like, that's long gone, long gone. I mean, over the course of the career of someone in their 20s right now, you're probably going to have six to 10 jobs, right? So, I mean, this also has an amazing ramification, which is that, don't sweat your first couple jobs. Like a lot of people believe in college. Oh my God, you know, I'm graduating. I got to make the perfect choice, you know, because I'm going to stay at this company the rest of my life. And <laughs> You're deluding yourself. I mean, you need to just chillax and, you know, pursue your interests. You got a lot of time. Mm. Uh, and a lot of the people that, that follow us are from a background of value chain, supply chain, manufacturing operations, right? The people that build stuff or move yeah. stuff, right? Transportation. I want to, to bring you to the chapter six of your book, which is sell your dream. And specifically in this, in this profession of supply chain operations, they tend to be people that do shit, not so much talk about shit, 
let alone <laughs> brag about the shit they did. Yeah. So I, I just want to, you know, I'm, I'm using this channel to also hopefully inspire some people to hey, come on, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about sell your dream part. Well, you know, the, it takes a lot to make this world work. And, you know, it's not all designers and it's not all influencers on TikTok. I mean, somebody's actually got to build the shit. And to build the shit, somebody's got to supply and it's got to go through that chain. And, you know, we, I think we all learned a valuable lesson when one ship got stuck in the Suez Canal, <laughs> like yeah. the whole world ground to a halt, right? <laughs> I mean, you talk about you know, everybody should have asked for a raise back then in the supply chain Maybe management business. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, like, I mean, seriously, there are some people, let's take engineering, for example. There's two kinds of engineers, right? So one engineer wants to write the first version of something and trailblazing, right? But you know what? After, the, after you have version one, it takes a different kind of mindset to have version one, 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 two, two, oh, three, oh, four, oh. And listen, it's very important to get version one but it's also important to get version three and four and five. But I think that takes a different kind of mindset. And it's not that one is more valuable than the other. I mean, both are necessary. So as, as I've gotten older and older, one of the things that I appreciate more and more is that I have come to believe that everybody you meet, literally everybody you meet can do something better than you. So if you think that you are just God's gift to mankind, you are full of shit because you know that that flight attendant that you just yelled at, she might be a better surfer than you or you know that waiter that you just yelled at, he might be a better photographer than you or maybe he makes tacos better than you or maybe he's a better father than you or a coach than you. So like, you know, you ought to chillax and and not think that the freaking world revolves around you because it doesn't and everybody you meet is probably better than you at something and yeah i mean at, at an extreme let's say you're a billionaire private equity or you know hedge fund manager and you think you are just the center of the universe and you know what you ain't because everybody you meet has can do something better than you <laughs> i love it one, one of the, my favorite quotes from you is, if you don't toot your own horn, don't complain that there's no music. Yes. And I wanted to get to see if you have one or two anecdotes, because I believe that to be very true. There's a lot of people that as long as I do good work, somebody will see me and promote me. Ah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, I'm not too sure. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. So first of all, I would rather have someone doing good work who doesn't know how to toot their horn than someone who toots their horn but doesn't do good work. <laughs> it's yeah. much easier to fix the horn tooting than the work, okay? So if you are a person who does good work but doesn't do your horn tooting, that's really easy to fix. But if you're just doing shit and you can toot your horn, that's really hard to fix, let me tell you. So I, I, you know, it, it sort of comes back to what I just said that you, you should be proud of your interests and knock on wood. Some of those interests turn into passions. And it's, I think another thing I realized is that, you know, sometimes you, you know, other employees and they're not quite as dedicated as you. And they're not, you know, trying to strive to be the top and all that. And you think, what's wrong with this person? This person doesn't have ambition or you know, this person is not as intelligent or whatever than me, right? And and I've also figured out that you don't know what's going on in that person's life, right? So you think, why isn't this person putting in the overtime and working hard and, you know, rising up the corporate ladder? Well, maybe he or she is a single parent. Maybe he or she is a single parent caring for two generations, one older than you and one younger than you. Or maybe that person just looks at a job as a way to put food on the table, but their true passion is ceramics or something. Like, who are you to judge what's important to another person? Mm. You talk about embracing vulnerability in one of the chapters in the 
in the book. Yeah. And specifically, I, I think there's a big gender, there's big gender discrepancies as well. And and I, I heard you say at some point, I, I, I listened to you saying that you believe that women are definitely, you know, so one, they might be vulnerable, but two, there's definitely a lot of gender based also attacks and discrimination and so on. So I wanted to bring that that topic. I also believe that is that is true and get your perspective specifically on gender. Yeah. Well, I have lots of thoughts here. So first of all, yeah. I think that men have screwed up the world for 2000 years. So now let's just let women run the world for 2000 years. Let's see what happens because can't get any worse. I mean, I, I, I just think men are we're at the we're at the edge of maybe the end of mankind, like literally, literally, especially in the United States, literally, we could be, you know, at a crisis point. So I say, let's let women run the companies and run the countries. Okay. That's number one. Number two is that in, in all the positions I've held and all my background, the gating item is not money. Mm. It's really talent, right? So if you have talent, everything else flows. And so I also believe that talent is kind of uniformly and randomly distributed among genders and sexual orientations and religions and skin color and all that. So it seems to me if you figured out that the hard part is building a great team, why would you eliminate half the genetic pool by saying we're only going to recruit men or we're only going to recruit white men or we're only going to recruit white men who went to Ivy League schools like I did? Like, you know, you, you just wiped out a lot of people who would be very valuable. So why would you do something that stupid? And yeah, but, you know, clearly <laughs> there are entire political parties in the United States who believe that, right? Like. I don't understand this. I, it, it's just not rational to me. And mm -hmm. I'm a rational person. It's not rational to me to, to have some of these stupid rules and, you know, just these, like, just putting people into a box. I do not understand that at all. Mm. And further, further on the topic of, of vulnerability at the workplace, yeah. There's been quite a few, if you read the, the articles, and that, that's why I'm a little bit, again fed up with the political correctness and so there's you know what companies say they do and what they actually do but what they say they do or they say they want to do maybe more accurately yes embrace vulnerability you know show that you're human then you go in and especially in this hyper competitive you know stock listed company forget yeah. that i mean <laughs> you you say that you don't know they like yeah. they crucify you yeah? so, <laughs> so talk a so, little bit to this yeah yeah so you know, I, I, every, th this book is based on my podcast where I've interviewed about 250 remarkable people like Jane Goodall, Steve Wozniak, Margaret Atwood, Stephen Wolfram, you know, from MacArthur Fellow Awards, all these people. And every one of them, every stinking one of them had a growth mindset. And so the, the flip side of having a growth mindset, the believing you can learn new skills and stuff is to embrace vulnerability, because when you try something new, you will suck at it. So you need to be able to embrace vulnerability. If you, if you take up surfing at 60, you need to be able to say to yourself, I know I'm gonna get hurt. <laughs> I know I'm gonna be embarrassed and still I'm gonna do it. And, and, and that is just the key now. But I, I have a further refinement on the growth mindset, which I learned just in about a month ago, which is it's not the growth mindset is primarily in your head, right? Do you believe you can grow? But in order for you to grow, you also need to be in an environment that supports growth because you could be in a company that doesn't support growth. They believe that, you know, they hired people who are proven geniuses and those proven geniuses, they don't need to learn anything more. And those proven geniuses also cannot deteriorate because they're a proven genius. You know, that's like a God given thing. And so if, if you have that attitude now, if you're not marked as a proven genius on day one, they believe that you cannot ever achieve greater things. 
And so maybe, you know, maybe you're hired as a secretary or a, or a, you know, operator or customer service or shipping and handling. And they believe, well, that's the peons. You know, those are the mediocre people. No one can progress from that. Only the geniuses are geniuses. I mean, just everything I just said just makes me want to throw up. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that you need a growth mindset in your head, but you also need to be in a growth environment. So the question is, how do you ter determine if you're in a growth environment? And I think there's two ways. One is you look at Glassdoor and you see what people say on Glassdoor. That's number one. But number two, I think that, you know, you look at, the management and is it diverse is it 90 percent white males right i mean that's not a good sign because it's not like only white males have intelligence and competence <laughs> i think it's randomly and evenly distributed and and so from the outside looking in you read glass door you look at their management and then i i hate to say this because in like eight states they're trying to kill it but you look at dei programs are there DEI programs? So people around the world, they might not be familiar with the term DEI. It's for diversity, equality, and inclusion. And basically what it means is there are programs for LGBTQ plus people, for minorities, for, you know, all the people that are not the so-called proven geniuses. And, and if you see a lot of DEI programs and a lot of programs about training and development, it's a signal that this company believes in the growth of its employees. And if you don't see those kind of programs, then it means that the company does not believe in growth. And if you have a growth mindset, you might be very unhappy there. Mm -hmm. I'll play, I'll play devil advocate for just a second. And let, let me see how I frame this because I'm, I'm entering dangerous territory but i'll do it because it's a cool conversation <laughs> uh, so i'm i'm with you and i'm you know we have a i don't know a super diverse team we have you know in alcott we have uh, and i i believe we walk the talk yeah we don't have just you know people like me <laughs> i mean i'm a little bit the minority i i would i would say on the flip side to, to the point that you said that there are you know you should look at what are they doing to in, to encourage diversity and inclusion and it's it's in, diversity inclusion there's other topics as well yeah let's i'll name one right sustainability very important topics don't get me wrong and i think we should definitely zero in on it i won't name the company but i'll give you i'll i'll i'll, I'll put it on the topic of sustainability right because there's one company that went very among the first in the world yeah they went sustainability in our products and so on and it was brilliant yeah and i mean they almost led the way to the whole to the whole industry and then at some point they they drank too much kool-aid you know guy they, they <laughs> where it went to okay now it's flipped to we are very good at this as humans right we are not good at balance we are extremely good at going from one extreme to the other right so they went too far out and then what happened well you know margins eroded shareholders at some point like hey guys yeah your sustainability sure but <laughs> make money yeah i mean it is a business after all right so you if you just say that you're sustainable but you're not making money now they you know there's a new management coming in cost cut you know they basically went from here to <laughs> so i feel there's a little bit of also that that risk with dei i mean again to your point like let's have women rule the world because men already we know what they did or what we did I don't, but there's, you know, there's that balancing act, which is kind of hard. And we, we also wow. enter a space where it's too much, right? It's too, it can be too much. So I just want to, I'm yeah, well, it as much okay. as I can, but yeah. Granted, intellectually, I agree that it can be too much, but <laughs> let's just say that there are probably not too many examples of companies who died because they were too diverse. <laughs> <laughs> or companies that died because they were too worried about sustainability, right? I mean, there's a lot. There are more companies who died because of the greed of the top management than because they were over diverse. I mean, listen, I, I'm not saying any company should die at all, but I mean, if you're going to die, die because you were too diverse or too sustainable, then I think that's pretty much okay. But, you know, 
most companies die because of greed, not because of oh, the greed or stupidity. The greed is easy to understand. Stupidity is when you you no longer grow, right? You, yeah. you know, you're not innovative. You just like Blockbuster. Blockbuster where you rented DVDs. Why didn't Blockbuster become Netflix? Right. Because, you know, Blockbuster, they looked at their business as we have brick and mortar stores where people come in, they rent the DVD, they return the other one, they go home and they plug it in and they watch. Right. So so they they define their business in terms of brick and mortar stores. But if they were working back from the customer, if they were truly realizing what the customer was getting, the customer was getting like convenient forms of entertainment. Yep. Right. That's what they wanted. Well, if you think about it for 30 seconds, what's more convenient than streaming? I mean, how can you compare getting in your car, driving to the blockbuster store, parking, going inside, looking at a limited line of you know, DVDs <laughs> on the wall, standing in line, checking it out, going home, sticking it in your, you know, in your TV, coming back, parking again, turning it in. Or you can click on stream, right? How can you possibly believe that that is not a better model? Well, that's just plain stupidity, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know what to say. And there's so many examples, right? I mean, there's so many. Kodak, I mean, yes. they have even the technology. Kodak. Right? Kodak <laughs> invented the digital camera, Radu. They invented the digital camera. And they died because they wanted to stick with film. I do not understand that. But so, so hear, hear me out for a second, because I've been, again, horrified the last three months. So I talked to, you know, a lot of executives and I'm 95% in the last three. That's why it's also the, the frequency of this conversation is what a little bit scares me. Because in the last three months alone, it's more or less the same pattern where I talk to a frustrated board member or CEO, regardless of the industry almost. <laughs> And they tell me, Rado, this is getting out of hand, right? The board wants, you know, shareholder value, la la, but that's what quarter by quarter by quarter, like long term, we're, we're taking stupid decisions. <laughs> so, and some of them said, look, I throw in the towel, I'm out. I cannot stand in front of my team to explain logically why we do what we do. <laughs> and, and 5%, you know, there's some, I'll, I'll name one, right? I had a discussion with an executive of Microsoft, at least, you know, I was like, okay, long term. Yeah, I'm like, oh, there's at least, you know, some <laughs> that still think long term. But we, it's almost like a disease of of boards that by and large and CEOs thinking short term, shareholder, you know, window dressing, basically, like taking decisions yeah. to, to kind of, how do you, you know. <laughs> well, well. Number one is that it's much easier to be a writer than a CEO. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm a writer. Okay. <laughs> so that, that coupled with that is the fact that, you know, I bet you these CEOs are saying this, they have a completely undiversified, undiversified executive staff and board of directors. Oh, well, maybe if they had some diversification, they would be in a stronger position. Duh. I mean, you know, did you ever think of that? And I, so that's another data point. Another data point is, listen, those, those CEOs, they're making one, two, three, five, $25 million a year. You expect me to have sympathy for them? Frick. I mean, you know, Put on your big boy pants and just be a freaking leader. My God, that's what you get the big box for, right? So tough shit is my answer to that. And I, I think, listen, if it was an easy, easy job, more people would do it and, and you wouldn't have to pay people as much to do it. That's why you get the big box. So don't, com don't complain to me about how hard it is. That's what it is. Now, you can make the case that the financial markets where they want good results every 90 days. I mean, listen, you bought into that game, right? I mean, you entered that game. When, when you were negotiating your CEO package, you were negotiating for stock options, right? I mean, so yeah, so when the stock options go up and you get a lot of money, you like the 90 day reporting and financial markets and public markets, but when you don't deliver results and your options go down and everything like now, ah, oh, the game is rigged. This is an unfair game. I mean, freaking cry, cry, don't cry for me, Argentina. I mean, give me a break. 
You want to know how I really feel? <laughs> <laughs> no, a fair, a fair, fair point. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm almost wondering. So no sympathy for the CEOs. I mean, I, I think the most blatant injustice, I would call it. If not, I don't, I, I can't come up with a better word, with a stronger word. The guy at Boeing walking away with 20, 30, 40, I don't know. I mean, they're discussing oh, the, the, the package. severance. I mean, yeah. Like what? Like he should go to jail. Like, I mean, like, what do you mean that you're walking <laughs> away with tens of millions for what? Like for planes, you know, the, which doors jump, I mean, fly off for people getting uh, listen, hurt. Listen, I mean, it, but you know, th this is. You hear this kind of story all the time, right? So if you screw up big enough, you get compensated. You gotta, but you gotta really screw up. You cannot <laughs> kind of screw up, right? You cannot just retire as a semi-successful CEO. You really gotta screw up. And I I I guess the thing, well, you're a headhunter, you can explain this better to me, but you know, the mo the I guess the intellectual reason is the we take highly successful executives and we ask them to leave their successful positions and take a risk and go to another company. So in order to get that kind of talent, we have to have these golden parachutes that protect them in case, you know, they get fired or whatever. But, and I, you know, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that. If you screw up big enough, I mean, if you screw up big enough, you should get nothing. Yeah. <laughs> there should be a I don't clause understand there. Like, that either. On. Like there should be a clause. But I guess what I'm saying, and I mean, back to let's let's talk, take our job, right? And when we place people, we always conduct informal ref checks. And I strongly believe in that. Uh, formal ref checks, no, nobody's going to put people that talk badly about them. Nobody's dumb. Right. And, and especially right. at the executive level, the. So when you do informal checks, you know, you ask their boss, fine, but people tend to be good at managing upwards. So I trust that a little bit, <laughs> not a lot. Peers, yeah, that's where it gets a lot more, you know, a lot more real. Subordinates, that's where it really gets real, right? Because that's where the reality kicks in because you don't pretend to your subordinate, right? They report to you, no need. So that's where if you ask a few subordinates, you really get a sense, is this person a good leader? Was he a dictator, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, harsh or whatever it was. So we, we try to do that all the time because it's part of what we believe we paid for. Now, that doesn't really happen at scale somehow. I, I'm shocked. Like it's and even I mean, I have, you know, in fairness, I've seen my own advice ignored because, you know, nepotism or whatever, <laughs> like, you know. So, so that's where there's an element of that. And there's these circles of people that we discussed a little bit, you know, oh, my body this, my body that, la, la, la. Okay, fine. And then you have this system, this capitalistic system, where I'm not, not, not here to start a revolution, but I'm almost just wondering, have we, are we reaching the end of this quarter by quarter results of, you know, just make more money? Make, I mean, it's like, where does meaning and where does impact come into play? How do we even measure that, right, in a way? Um it's it's hard to imagine that we're coming to the end of this kind of system because there's too many people invested in the system continuing as is. I mean, you know, with Boeing, it's obvious because the freaking, you know, the window pops out, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's that's hard to hide that. But but in, you know, I mean, if you're the executive of a Fortune 500 company and you don't see the switch to electric cars or you don't see cloud-based computing coming or something like that i mean isn't that your job i <laughs> yeah, I, uh, what else can you say well i you know for people listening they're wondering what the hell does this have to do with thinking remarkable and i i gotta tell you this book is not meant for fortune 500 ceos who want to protect their stock option plan i mean that's 500 people i'm willing to lose as potential readers of my book <laughs> you, you, you'll do you'll do just fine now <laughs> guy among final questions for you if if you were to give some pieces of advice of how could a young professional starting in their career or entrepreneur or even student how but really the the core you know that you, you have a lot of gems in the book okay and when you distill it what's your favorite or one two you know go okay to? so i have two pieces of advice the first piece of advice, people may be shocked to hear, but I will tell you that your job, this is for the student or the person, you know, early in his career, her career, 
Your job is to make your boss look good. That's your job. I think many people have this really stupid belief of my job is to show my boss up. I want to show people that I'm better than my boss because they're going to fire my boss and promote me in his or her place. I have never, ever, ever seen that happen. So I'm telling you that your job is to make your boss look good. And when your boss look good, you look good. And when your boss progresses, you progress. You just tag along with your boss as long as he or she is making progress and then Someday your boss is going to be so successful that you can just bask in their halo and you can get another job at another company because you work for a very successful person and help make them successful. You're going to get a great fucking reference from them. Pardon my French. So all that is true. So make your boss look good. Okay. And the second thing is make yourself indispensable. So making yourself indispensable means that Everybody understand that you are so valuable. Now, how do people how do people come to the conclusion that you're indispensable? Well, I swear to God, 90% of it is just keep showing up. Just keep showing up. Not switching every year, every 18 months, not jumping ship, you know, just water the grass and fertilize the grass you're standing on, not looking always for greener grass, just like just keep showing up. And when you keep showing up, do the shit work that nobody else wants to do. So if you keep showing up and doing the shit work that nobody else wants to do, you're going to be indispensable. And when you're indispensable, your boss is going to understand you're indispensable. And then you're going to get pay raises and you're going to get more options and you're going to get more opportunities because nobody wants to lose you. It is that simple. Now, the problem is that, you know, many people believe that, oh, my God, we went through the pandemic and now, you know, we didn't we we work remotely. So I was working two hours a day from Bali or two hours a day from Cancun. And now they want me back in the office and. Well, I hate to tell you, but you know what? If you want to be remarkable, you got to show up and you got to do the shit work that nobody else wants to do. And if you want to work two hours a day from Bali and, you know, okay, God bless you. There's a time and a place for that. But I honestly cannot tell you that I believe that that's going to make you remarkable. And I, and I also will tell you that I'm going to lose all the potential buyers of my book when I say this next thing, which is that, that uh, do not necessarily pursue this concept of work-life balance. Work-life balance, I think, is a myth. And what happens is that there's going to be times in your life where you're not going to have work-life balance. You're just going to have to work. And there's going to be times in your life when you can have balance. But to constantly be trying to thread the needle where every job has work-life balance I think is not going to work. You're just going to have to show up, do the shit work, and you're going to have to shift that work-life balance towards work and less balance. And you're going to have to make sacrifices. That's the way it is. And, you know, if you don't believe that, there are a lot of other books that can tell you how to achieve this <laughs> perfect work-life balance and be successful. Go read their books. That's not my book. My book is about you got to earn it. Love it. I mean, I have one final question, but I just do need to give this example. So about 15 years ago, there's this book that came out. A really good book, eh, by the way. The 4-Hour Workweek. Really yeah. good principles. Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss, really good guy. Eh? I mean, I've been yeah. following since. I mean, I when I read that book, I was, you know, 25. I don't know. Oh, God, that's it. You know, oh, screw this. I mean, screw this work. And then at, at that time, I didn't really take it at heart. But there was one guy that was ironic, at, you know, at Tim and was saying, you know, Tim, for a guy that wrote, a, you know, a book called The 4-Hour Workweek, you sure spend 80 hours a week promoting your book. <laughs> <laughs> And that's kind of, you know, that's kind of, and, and you can get a four hour work week, but you know, you might make a hundred K and that's fine. Huh? It's like to make, you know, if you want to make millions and that doesn't need to be the goal of anybody, but if you want to make millions, you're unlikely to do it over a four, unless you sell drugs, which is highly dangerous, but you know, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I mean. Just, 
you know, don't get me wrong. Tim Ferriss is a friend and that is a brilliant work title, title for a book. But I think the concept that you can work four hours a week and be highly successful is flawed. I don't know anybody who does that. I mean, you know, knock on wood, prove me wrong. You do that, right? But I'm telling you, show up, do the shit work, make yourself indispensable. That's my formula. <laughs> <laughs> make your boss look good. Yeah, uh, show up, keep doing, keep doing the work. Yeah. Last question for you guys. So, okay, you know, you you were with Canva at the very, I mean. 2013 i didn't quite look when Canva started but that must have been at the very beginning of the story yeah now they're super successful so i guess my how how did it happen like how did they you know how did you find them did they find you how you know okay chemistry? so yeah. this proves that it's better to be lucky than smart so at the time i was active on twitter and uh, my social media person and i we came to the conclusion that every tweet should have a video or a picture yeah so she was using Twitter, uh, she was using Canva to, to make tweets. And Canva noticed that I was using Canva. So Canva reached out to me and said, you know, guy, we noticed that you're using our product. We're going to be in the United States soon. We'd love to discuss how we could work together. And so I, I went to the social media person and I said, isn't this the company we use to make graphics? She goes, yeah. I said, well, is it good? She goes, oh, yes, very good. And I said, should I help them? She said, yeah, help them. <laughs> and so that's how, that was the due diligence. And that's how I found them, which is to say that they found me. And, you know, this is my theory of guys golden touch, which is not that whatever I touch is gold. Excuse me, I said that wrong. It's not that whatever I touch, I can turn to gold. It's whatever I touch is golden. So that's the key. You touch gold and you declare victory. I'm very good at that. But, you know, at least I know that's what I'm doing. And so, you know, would Canva be as successful without me? Yes. I. There's no doubt in my mind because Melanie Perkins is such a good CEO. And her two co-founders, Cliff Obrick and Cameron Adams, are also excellent people. And I know a lot of companies and I don't know any company that is more dedicated to perfecting everything they do. You know, not just engineering, not just marketing, everything yeah. they do, they're trying to perfect. And it's it's like, you know, Lexus, the, the you know, constant pursuit of perfection. And that's, that's how Canva found me. And that's why it's better to be lucky than smart because they found me, I didn't find them. <laughs> Awesome. Well, guys, it's been a tremendous pleasure. You know, I cannot uh, suggest strong enough to the people following this to, to get your book, to follow you, to also listen oh, to the podcast. Thank and thanks a lot for joining us. And I'm really, really grateful for your time. Oh, one more thing. You know, if you're not a book reader, Canva has a lesson on how to be remarkable that we created so you don't have to read the book. I'll send it to you. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll make sure it gets posted in all the right places. And okay. um, big, big thanks for, for joining us and for all oh, your nuggets of wisdom. It's very fun. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you like what you heard, be sure to go to www.elcodglobal.com and click the podcast button for all the show notes of the interview. Also, subscribe to our mailing list to get our latest updates first. If you're listening through a streaming platform like iTunes, Spotify, or Stitcher, we would appreciate a kind review. Five star works best to keep us going and our production team happy. And of course, share it with your friends. I'm most active on LinkedIn, so do feel free to follow me. And if you have any suggestions on what, what to do and who to invite next, don't hesitate to drop me a note. And if you're looking to hire top executives or transform your business, of course, contact us as well to find out how we can help.